Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Billy with Wolf River Music Television, and I'd like to welcome you to episode four. Today, we're way up at the top of the Kirkwood Bowl, and we're gonna look at some houses that are associated not only with John Lennon, but also with the birds. It's gonna be a great day. Okay, so for those of you who were with us at the end of episode three, the second half, you'll remember that we ended up at the house of Paul Rothschild, who of course had been the producer for The Doors. Well, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a leisurely little stroll back here on these nice, quiet, shady little back roads, and we're heading to a very small road known as Oak Court. And on Oak Court, there are just about four houses, and we're interested in two of them. And they're very similar to one another. They're kind of difficult to see from the ground level because they're very high up off the ground on stilts. So far off the ground, in fact, that they actually have outdoor elevators, which resemble small boxcars that you might see like in an old mine or something. And they actually take the residents up to the house way up at the top because apparently they're kind of difficult to get to. So one of those houses belonged to Jim Ladd and right next door the other house belonged to Elliot Mintz. Now I'll get more to who exactly they were later. The Elliot Mintz house in particular has a very interesting connection to John Lennon in that John lived here in Laurel Canyon in the house of Elliot Mintz for a period of about 16 or 17 months between the late summer of 1973 up until the early part of 1975. And this was during a time which was commonly referred to in John Lennon's life as his lost weekend. Now this was considered a very difficult time period in John Lennon's life. And I'm going to document a few of the incidents that happened while John was here in the Los Angeles area. Some of the trouble that he got himself into and some of the other things that he experienced while he was living here in Laurel Canyon. And here we are, as you can see, there's one of the elevators. That's the Elliot Mintz house right there. And we're gonna try to take a look up, but you're not gonna be able to see much of the house. It's way up there. But we'll get a better look at it later, I promise. Well, there's a little bit of it right up there. You can just sort of catch a glimpse of it. And the Jim Ladd house is going to be right next door. And also there's the elevator that goes up to the Jim Ladd house, which is actually even more difficult to see from the ground. Jim Ladd lived here, right next door to the Elliot Mintz house. Now, he was a radio DJ who started here in the Los Angeles area in 1969. And he quickly became nationally famous because of his successful program known as Interview. He basically pioneered the idea of a very listener interactive format uh, with a style that he liked to refer to as freeform rock radio. 
He worked for a lot of different stations throughout his career, and he even lost a few jobs because he always refused to adhere to any commercial playlist formats that he just didn't feel like being a part of. He was really great friends with the late Tom Petty, uh, who you may know wrote the song The Last DJ about him in 2002. Jim Ladd doesn't live here in this house anymore, but he is still alive. And at the age of 73, he actually still works in radio uh, with a program on Sirius XM called Deep Tracks. And he remains as fiercely independent as he has always been. Elliot Mintz lived back here. You can barely see it up there, but it's a brown, very tall house that's up on stilts. So in the late 60s, in the early 70s, he worked in radio and television and really made his mark as an interviewer with a very cutting edge, underground kind of a style. And he also possessed a very distinctive radio voice, uh, which was purposefully enunciated and he spoke in a very eloquent and deeply refined manner. Very thoughtful, very rhetorical. I'm sure that was a truly awful impression of him, so my apologies. I'm actually not trying to make fun of him. I actually really think he sounds cool and I enjoy listening to him talk. He's obviously a very intelligent man and he is always very impeccably dressed. And as a very well-groomed professional, he was also a very successful publicist, and his clients included Bob Dylan, uh, Diana Ross, the late Neil Peart, drummer for Rush, and even Paris Hilton. But most notably, his clients were John Lennon and Yoko Ono, whom he was also extremely close friends with. Now at this point, I'm gonna segue into the connection between Elliot Mintz and John Lennon and John's time spent out here in this house between 1973 and 1974. This was during a time period which was considered possibly the lowest point in John Lennon's personal life. It lasted roughly about 18 months and during this very difficult time in his life, even he referred to this as his lost weekend. In 1973, while John Lennon was in the process of recording his album, Mind Games, he was also dealing with some pretty serious relationship issues with his wife, Yoko Ono. He was also going through sort of like a midlife period of self-doubt, and he was hoping to be able to reinvent his career by distancing himself from many of the political issues that he had previously embraced and had been quite vocal and adamant about. He had been so politically outspoken for so many years that he was now being monitored by the FBI. They were tapping his phone, they were closely watching all of his movements, and he was becoming extremely paranoid and very stressed out about all of this. Even his immigration status was in question at this time and he was worried literally about being deported from the United States. During this time, John and Yoko were not getting along very well at all. And she was working on her own solo album right at the same time. So John began drinking heavily and at Yoko's insistence, John was actually asked to leave in order for both of them to have some space and some time apart from one another. Yoko even asked their professional assistant, Mei Pang, to begin a personal relationship with John in order for him to have a trusted female companion 
with him at all times. It was a romantic relationship, and it was fully approved of by his own wife. She still loved John, but they were literally driving each other crazy, and she just wanted and needed a break from him. So this is where Elliot Mintz comes back into the picture. As I previously stated, he was not only their publicist at the time, but he was also very close to them both personally. So Elliot was asked to take John in, give him a safe place to stay in Los Angeles, and to more or less keep an eye on him since his behavior was beginning to become a bit erratic and unpredictable. This arrangement was mostly positive, but it had mixed results. And John Lennon wasn't going to be controlled or told what to do. And he also didn't spend all of his time or every single night here at this house during his time in Los Angeles. What didn't really seem to help matters much was that after John arrived here, he began spending a large amount of his time with a close drinking buddy and fellow Hellraiser, Harry Nilsson. Even Ringo Starr got in on the festivities from time to time, and this trio, along with some other friends, began to refer to themselves as the Hollywood Vampires Club. Now, there's no real reason to just keep hammering away at John Lennon's bad behavior during this time period, even though there were several dozen reported incidents that happened, some of these which even made national papers, he obviously was having some issues in his life that later even he readily admitted to and that he was just able to overcome in time. But just to sum it all up, it seems like there was one single incident that occurred more towards the end of his reign of terror here in Hollywood that was most indicative of what was happening with him at that time. Anyone who has ever studied or followed the life and the career of John Lennon would have to acknowledge that this one was probably the one that was most out of character for his professional personality and his public persona. This incident happened in March of 1974 at the famous Troubadour nightclub located in West Hollywood. All right. So here's what happened at the Troubadour nightclub on the night of March 11th, 1974, involving John Lennon and several of his friends. And I'm going to try to be as fair as I possibly can. So what I've done is I've consulted several different sources for the story of what happened. And there's lots of different versions. It all depends on who you ask. There was John's version. There was Harry Nilsson's version. There was the owner of the Troubadour nightclub and his version. There were employees, one a particular waitress who actually pressed charges against John Lennon for assault. There was the Smothers Brothers version. And again, we'll get to all of that in just a moment. But let's start with a little bit of back history. This was not the first time that John had had trouble at the Troubadour. He had actually been on a couple of other occasions asked to leave. He was not a favorite among many of the employees that worked there. Apparently, again, John was drinking heavily. He would get inebriated and become very rude. He would become dismissive. He would become an ass. He would forget to tip people, or he would specifically on purpose not tip people and tell them that he was not tipping them. There was all kinds of reasons why he was not the favorite patron of the employees of the Troubadour nightclub. So with that in mind, know that when John showed up with his entourage, including, again, as we've already said before, his drinking buddy, Harry Nielsen, they proceeded to get drunk. And the act that night was the Smothers Brothers. And if you don't know who they are, well, you know, they were a duo of two brothers who were a comedy group. And I don't think in 1974 they were necessarily in their prime. 
and they were trying to actually mount a bit of a comeback for themselves. And so this was a night that they were hoping to be their night, to be a special evening. And I don't think that they were anticipating having it disrupted in the way that John Lennon and Harry Nilsson ended up disrupting the evening. But it kind of goes basically like this. They were doing their act on stage. John and Harry were getting drunk. And they began heckling the Smothers Brothers. And it started off kind of lighthearted and just typical. The Smothers Brothers attempted to just ignore them. But as the evening wore on, the heckling became a little more obscene and a bit more aggressive. And it got to the point of where they actually stopped their show in the middle of it because they were beginning to get really annoyed and upset. Then, according to them, this was where they made their own fatal mistake, was that they began interacting with John and basically heckling him back. That just made the situation worse. Well, it got to the point of where then it became physical. There was some physical violence. There was some punches thrown. People came down off the stage and confronted him. And, well, being in the state of mind that he was in, he was happy to oblige them and confronted them right back. Well, of course, that very quickly got out of hand. He was asked to leave. He refused. Then he was forcibly removed. And that's when it really got bad. And according to some of the witnesses, there were some punches thrown and in the scuffle with some of the nightclub personnel at the Troubadour, John lost his glasses. And apparently, John is extremely nearsighted, can't see anything without his glasses. And in the melee that was ensuing, he struck one of the waitresses who happened to be somewhere close to him. Now, whether he did it on purpose, again, it all depends on who you ask. He claims he couldn't see and he hit somebody in the face. He didn't know who it was, and he didn't do it on purpose. Well, she claims that he punched her in the face on purpose, so she filed charges against him. They ended up settling out of court. She got a sum of money, and the incident went away. And of course, the local media had a heyday with this one. There's lots of photos. I'm sharing a few of them with you right now. There's dozens and dozens of these. They're all more or less basically the same thing. It's John being thrown out of the Troubadour nightclub. It was an embarrassment for him, and he was not happy with what had happened. He tried to make apologies to everyone involved, including the Smothers Brothers. He sent apology letters. He even sent flowers to them. And so to sum it all up, I guess we can just consider this another incident that was just within a very dark chapter of John Lennon's life.
I'm up on Magnolia Avenue right now at the very top of Laurel Canyon. And in September of 1966, Roger McGuinn and Chris Hillman of the Birds were standing somewhere right here in this general area. Because at that time, Chris Hillman was renting a house that was over here on this property behind me. Now, what happened to that house? We'll get to that part in just a minute. But first, let's find out what exactly were they doing out here on that late summer night at this overlook. Well, what they were doing was they were having a bit of a laugh at a teeny bopper pop music magazine that they were looking at. And in that magazine, there was an article about their fellow neighbors, musician, friends, the monkeys. Now, as we all know, at least in the very beginning, the monkeys were basically a group of four young guys who were chosen and put together to be on a television program that was marketed to young teens. Now, we know that those four guys were cast in that TV show, not based necessarily on whether or not they had any musical abilities, but more based on how they looked and whether or not they had any comedic timing. Now, were the guys in the monkeys musicians? Actually, yes, they were, but that's not why they were cast in that TV show. Now, if you don't believe me about that part, uh, you would then probably need to speak with Stephen Stills because he actually auditioned for one of those parts in the Monkees TV show. But he was turned down because the casting agents told him that he had a receding hairline and crooked teeth. So he suggested to his best friend and his roommate at the time to go and audition for that same part. And his friend got the part. So who was that you ask? Well, that was Peter Tork. So Roger and Chris may have been having a good hearted laugh at these photos in the magazine. And the whole idea of these guys in their 20s uh, being marketed to 13 year old kids. But at some point in that conversation, they actually began to wonder about their own musical careers as young pop stars and they began to question their own musical validity and maybe just started to question the whole idea of the value of the music uh, that they were writing and recording at that time. Maybe really even more the staying power of the whole music scene that they were in and just popular music in general. And so as they stood here at this overlook and looked down at the twinkling lights of Los Angeles and Hollywood down below, they started to get some lyrical ideas. And so they started to write a song together.
So, Chris Hillman lived in a house that he rented up here on Magnolia Avenue. And in October of 1966, that house burned completely to the ground. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about exactly what happened in just a minute. But first, let's figure out where it was. Now, there has been some debate as to where the house stood. And some people have wondered whether or not it was back here in this area behind me. But I don't see how it could have been that one. That one looks a little bit too old to me. And it seems more obvious that it would have been right back here on the other side of this stone wall for a lot of reasons. Well, first of all, because there's not a house back here anymore. <laughs> if you take a look over here, there's all kinds of wacky stuff. You got a mobile home trailer and a sketchy little building sitting up there on the top of that hill and then a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but one of the things that I think kind of gives it away is inside here, this little staircase that doesn't really seem to go to anything in particular. And my theory is, is that the top half of the house stood up here. And if you look at this picture, this was the house that Chris Hillman lived in. There's Chris down at the bottom and the rest of the birds up on the upper level is that my theory is the house was actually right down here in this area, the bottom half of it anyway, probably the garage area. And then the top half would have been up right up there. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let Chris describe in his own words what actually happened out here. After the fire started and he caught himself on fire a little bit he uh, basically explains that he lost everything the whole house went up in flames almost immediately and he only escaped with the burned clothing that he was wearing at the time and his car he lost all of his motorcycles he lost all of his guitars all of his memorabilia basically pretty much everything the whole house was destroyed can you imagine how long it must have taken for a fire truck to get up that road right there. I mean, I don't even see how they could get up here, honestly. So he jumps in his car, probably somewhere right in here, and says that he got on the dirt road that led out of the area. And now, as you can see, this is an asphalt road. I would imagine that in 1966, it probably was a very narrow dirt road now it's a very narrow asphalt road 
and he was able to escape. Now, unfortunately, this whole area is just really junked out. <laughs> it's really a shame. I don't know what's going on back here, but it doesn't look great. Beautiful view. Now, just as a point of reference, what we're going to do is we're actually going to walk out of here around the corner over to the Roger McGuinn house just to show you literally how close these two guys were living to one another at that time. So I'm leaving the old Chris Hillman property right now. I'm going to walk around the corner right up here on Magnolia Avenue and turn back on to Colcrest and tell you another little funny story about the fire. If there is a funny story to be told about a fire that burned someone's house down, is that immediately after it started, apparently the flames were already shooting up into the sky really high. And since Roger McGuinn lives just around the corner over here, he saw the flames going up into the sky. And he just happened to be able to very quickly grab some kind of a video recorder that he had at the time and he started filming it at that point he had no idea that it was Chris Hillman's house he had to have known that it was very close just based on the proximity and the direction so he's filming it and of course at this time Chris Hillman has probably already gotten into his car and come right around this corner right here which is Colcrest. Turned here in order to go down to Roger McGuinn's house. And so by the time he got over here, Roger had already been filming the fire for a few minutes anyway. And when Chris got here, he realized that, yeah, that was actually Chris's house that was burning. And so, that film that Roger McGuinn made of the fire actually ended up on the local affiliate of the news channel here in Los Angeles on the evening news. And so they watched it together and watched the flames of Chris's house go up into the air. And so, here we are. There's Roger's house right there. That's how close they lived to one another. What was that, about a 90 second walk? Right there. The earliest version of the band that would eventually later become the Birds consisted of Jim, AKA Roger, McGuinn, Gene Clark, and David Crosby, who formed a folk trio that they called the Jet Set in the spring of 1964. Michael Clark was asked to join the group as a drummer that very next summer. Now, in an earlier version of this same video episode, I apparently made what was misconstrued as disparaging remarks about Michael Clark, and I alluded to the idea that he was not actually a drummer at the time he was asked to join the group. So, let me add a little bit of history here and also allow me to clarify my earlier remarks. At the age of 17, Michael Clark ran away from home, which at that time was in Spokane, Washington, and he hitchhiked all the way to San Francisco. Now, had Michael Clark played the drums prior to the time that he ran away from home and hitchhiked to California? And the reason for that, by the way, was because he wanted to become a musician. Yes, he had played the drums while he was in high school, but literally just in garage bands with his friends. Did he own a drum kit? I'm not sure. I know that when he hitchhiked and ran away, he certainly didn't bring a drum kit with him. He probably had one, maybe a crude little beginner's kit, or he just borrowed a kit from a friend, but when he joined the Birds, he did not own a proper drum kit. He had a tambourine, 
He had a set of bongos, which he liked to play on the beach. And he had cardboard boxes that he banged on with drumsticks. And that is a fact. Now, if you want to call him a drummer, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. I really don't care. These are the facts. He didn't own a drum kit, and in the very first early rehearsals with the birds, he was playing on cardboard boxes and using a tambourine as a cymbal. That's a fact. And I need to make it very clear, I am not trying to pick on Michael Clark, because he actually eventually worked very hard, practiced, and became a drummer. Did he become an incredible drummer? No, he didn't. He was always a very basic drummer. So what? That's all they needed. And as a matter of fact, some of his best work is actually found on the song Eight Miles High. If you want to listen to Michael Clark at his best, go listen to that song. So I'm going to give him some credit. He actually became a decent drummer. I didn't say great. I said decent, adequate. And I hope that's a better clarification of my remarks about Michael Clark as a drummer. Again, you can hold whatever opinion you want about that subject. Now, listen, I have a drum kit. I have a studio. I have a very nice drum kit. And every now and then, I'll actually go over there and kind of play around on them. But that doesn't make me a drummer. And no one has ever hired me to play the drums in a band or on a studio recording. They would be stupid if they did. I'm not a drummer. Just because I play the drums doesn't make me a drummer. Roger McGuinn has made it very clear over the years that Michael Clark was hired because of his looks. They liked the fact that he had a haircut that looked like Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones, and they also believed that he actually was the best looking one of the entire group. Now, what I don't understand about that as a musician is why they didn't just actually hire an adequate drummer and then ask that person to get a haircut like Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. Either way, whatever. Moving on. In October of 1964, Chris Hillman was recruited as the final original member of this group as a bass player. And again, Chris Hillman was actually a mandolin player for a couple of other country bluegrass bands at that time, including the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers, and the Golden State Boys. So the fact that he had never actually played the bass guitar professionally in any other musical group didn't seem to be a factor, and he took to that instrument quite well, becoming very proficient at it in a relatively short time. So by November of 1964, this group is still known as the Jet Set, and they ended up being introduced to some of the upper management folks over at Columbia Records by, of all people, jazz legend Miles Davis. And they signed a contract with that record label on November 10th of 1964. They decided to change the name of the group to The Birds two weeks after that on Thanksgiving Day. And they purposefully decided to misspell the word Birds because they liked the fact that the Beatles had also purposefully misspelled their own band name.
Now, what I understand about Roger's house here is that at that time, there wasn't a lower level. It was actually up on stilts. And so this bottom half here has been built um, at some point after Roger left, many years after Roger left. In fact, even when Don Henley lived here in this house, he also said that the house was up on stilts and that when the wind blew really hard, the house would shake and it made him very nervous. And one thing I wanna show you too is this really cool mural that someone has painted on the side of the old Roger McGuinn house. Now, just as another little point of trivia, after Roger moved out, Don Henley moved in, and that probably would have been around 1969 or 70. And then at some point, Don Henley, of course, moved in with Glenn Fry over on Ridpath. Well, the occupant right after that was David Cassidy, who, of course, we know from the Partridge Family television show. Well, I have to say that that was quite interesting today. I hope you found it informative and I hope you learned something that you might not have known before. Tomorrow, we're gonna head over to Lookout Mountain Avenue and we're gonna see some other cool things. We're gonna see houses that are associated with the mamas and the papas. We're gonna see a house associated with members of the doors. It's gonna be cool. Please come back. Please remember to subscribe to our channel so that you'll always know when we have new videos for you to watch. This is Billy, and you've been watching Wolf River Music Television. I want you to have a fantastic day. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody lives in this one anymore, but I want you to stick around. Somebody over there is really excited. So as I'm leaving this area back here on Oak Court, I'm gonna go try to find somewhere to sit down in the shade because it's starting to get really hot. And I just want to talk a little bit more about my more personal feelings about John Lennon and of course his death. Um, it may seem that, you know, I'm having a little bit of a, a jab at him so to speak. But the truth of the matter is, is that during this time period when John Lennon was here in Laurel Canyon, during that 18 month period that he himself even refers to as his lost weekend, between 1973 and 1975, his overall behavior was not exactly always stellar. In fact, sometimes it was downright atrocious. So I think, you know, for what he was doing at that time, it's kind of fair game. It's very well documented. Everybody mostly knows what was going on with him at that time. But on a personal level, I think it's very important for everybody to know that I am a Beatles fan. I am a lifelong Beatles fan. In fact, my earliest childhood memories are of the Beatles and hearing albums like Rubber Soul, Revolver, Sgt. Pepper's, uh, Magical Mystery Tour, Abbey Road, Let It Be. All of those from their middle to late period. Oh, here's a nice 
shady spot to sit down. And so I grew up listening to the Beatles and it's been ingrained in me. I love them. I always have and I always will. You know, John Lennon, um, there's a lot of history there. Some of it's great, some of it not so great. You know, he's had his moments. I think to put it in perspective, the thing to remember about John Lennon is actually really how relatively quickly he was here and then he was gone. I mean, you're talking about a time period of 1963 when he began to uh, become more in the public conscience and become famous, obviously. And then by the end of 1980, he was gone. And there's two Beatles left. George Harrison, of course, has left us. Uh, but, you know, he ended up living another 21 years beyond John Lennon. Now, I don't have to stop the camera and get on Google on my phone and look up this date. It's burned into my memory. It will always be there. December 8th, 1980. Which is, of course, the day that John Lennon was murdered. I remember it vividly. I was 12 years old, and I was actually just four days shy of my 13th birthday. And, of course... At that point, again, had always been a Beatles fan for as long as I could have remembered. Going back to like the age of three is probably about the earliest memories that I can recall hearing their music. I knew who he was. I was very aware of who he was. And I was living in my parents' house, obviously, in the Houston area at that time. And my mom brought me the newspaper. It would have been the Houston Chronicle. Because, of course, back then, we didn't have the internet. And the only way you got news was either on the evening news or the newspaper. So she brought it in to me and showed me. And, of course, I was devastated. I read the article. And then immediately, I folded the newspaper up. And in my room, in the closet that was attached to my room, I put that newspaper up on the top shelf. And I left it there. Well, I guess it was about 18 months ago, I was back at my parents' house for Christmas with my wife and my family and my kids. And I just happened to be poking around in that closet and that newspaper was still there. It was folded and it was up on the top shelf where it had been for literally 40 plus years.